So may I begin? In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most beneficent. Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you all again today uh, for the lecture of Sir uh, Masood Ashraf Raja. We'll begin the proceedings with the name of Allah. I'll call Hafza Umayya from M. English third semester evening for the recitation and translation of a few verses from Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن of Allah from Satan's outcast in the name of Allah who is the most beneficent and the most merciful the most gracious who taught the mankind the Quran he created man he taught eloquent speech to the man thank you exactly Jazakallah now I would like to call Professor Masood Ashraf Raja to please come and uh, continue with the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you ready for the second day? It's not going to be very long. Uh, but before we start, uh, if you have any questions about what we covered yesterday, uh, any concerns, uh, please feel free to ask now or forever hold your peace. Okay. No questions? OK. So when we are writing some work regarding different languages, and we have to write many languages at the same time with the same as a score format. Does APA have some specific policy maintaining the format of lights? Uh, pretty much you will follow the same format. For example, if it's a block quote, you will block quote it. The only problem you will run into, which I do most of the times with MS Word, is that you cannot write Arabic, Persian, or uh, Urdu in cursive. So when you try to type it in, it kind of lays itself as single individual alphabet. So I have to use pages for that with uh, Apple's software pages because that renders cursive really well. Or you will probably have to type it somewhere else, take a snapshot, and then insert a snapshot in your page. Uh, there, is, there are special programs which uh, 
are really expensive. Like and all of Urdu studies used to have a special program that would allow them to do Urdu composition. But other than that, the rules would be the same. And then, in, if you're using MLA in parentheses, you will mention either it's whether it's your translation if you're translating it or someone else's translation. Uh, sir, mm -hmm. actually, my focus was regarding the number of words. Let's say there's a word in Urdu, K E D. Mm -hmm. If you write K E D together, right, will we count as one word? And if we write write that K and D A individually separately? Uh, it depends on how the word counts your words. You know, usually if it's one word over or two word less, it doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, any editor, if they're saying it must be 6,000 words, that is, is inclusive of your notes and everything else. But the only way they can count the words is when they put it in a word file and do, you know, count words. So at the end of the day, you might not have to edit out KLEA. You might have to edit out something else. It doesn't really, it won't really matter. But pretty much, I think the, the way word works is if it's, I don't even know how it will work with a cursive script, because it will probably read it as a, not a word, but as a letter. But uh, it's not going to be a big problem for you, unless you have huge chunks of Farsi or Arabic or Persian in them. And then in that case, it would already be a special case. So if an editor mentions something, you can go back and forth over it. Yeah. But good question. Yeah. Anything else? OK, so today is slightly different. Uh, it's just a, a brief uh, <coughs> analysis. Uh, kind of a plan is to, first of all, talk about the thesis statement, talk about incorporating theory, how do we do that, and uh, how to use secondary sources, and then how to use, um, how to build your argument. So what I have for right now is just a brief example of uh, an introductory paragraph of an essay, and then that moves into uh, a thesis. And then what we'll do is we will invite one or two of you to come and put your thesis on that little board over there. And then we'll go over it and see how we can enhance it, what must it do, what must it look like. So, but before you put your thesis in your article, of course, you have to have a brief introduction. Uh, an ideal introduction is that immediately situates your essay or article within the history of the text that you're talking about, within its scholarship, and then hint at what you're planning to do. So one paragraph at the most, two paragraphs, but preferably just one paragraph preceding your thesis. So can someone read it from there? Ever since Gigi, Zahir. Ever since Arabis and Dickman of Joseph Paul read for his representation of Africa, any serious critical study of Conrad's hot is must first take his stance on Conrad's alleged racism. In his famous speech, Hedge challenged two aspects of hot darkness its representation of Africa and Africans and the phenomenicity of the work itself. Hedge's main point seems to be about the noxious impact of hot darkness as a uh, darkness as a pedagogical tool about Africa, which is compounded by the canon uh, canonical uh, acceptance of the text itself. Unfortunately, however, it is timely intervention has actually enhanced the very canonicity uh, of part of darkness that the challenge for the debate after his intervention has mostly been focused on part of darkness. But as is obvious from Conrad's uh, Sova, Part of darkness is not his only major work about the cultures of the colonial uh, periphery and for Conrad to be a thoroughgoing racist. His representation of other cultures of the colonial uh, periphery must also be taken into account. Okay, good, thank you. So I'm going to just reread it with the kind of emphasis that is coming to my mind and then we'll talk about it, right? 
So ever since Achebe's indictment of Joseph Conrad for his representation of Africa, any serious critical study of Conrad's, of heart, of, Conrad's heart of Darkness must first take a stance on Conrad's alleged racism. In his famous speech, Achebe challenged two aspects of Heart of Darkness, its representation of Africa and Africans, and the canonicity of the work itself. Achebe's main point seems to be about the noxious impact of Heart of Darkness as a pedagogical tool about Africa, which is compounded, compounded by the canonical acceptance of the text itself. So, up to now, I mean, you can tell that there is not even a single sentence which is an appendage which doesn't need to be there. Every sentence counts for something, right? Compared to like a few introductions that I've read to, uh, I read one dissertation at the main campus which starts with, uh, mankind has been divided into men and women since the dawn of century. Right. So my, my question was, why do you need to tell us that? You know, uh, it's a feminist uh, dissertation. So, I mean, of course, it shouldn't even be mankind. It should be humankind, right? If you want to be gender neutral. But so, so that sentence doesn't belong there. You don't need to announce where we are or how long we have existed. So in this introductory paragraph, you have to make sure that every sentence has a purpose in there, that there is no padding. You know, you're not trying to make 10,000 words. You're trying to say something very complex in 6,000 words. You, you cannot have anything that doesn't need to be there, right? So, so the first sentence basically starts with the major controversy about Achebe's Heart of Darkness, right? Everyone who's a Conrad scholar knows that in 1977, I think, Achebe gave a lecture, uh, a convocation speech, in which he basically indicted ha Joseph Conrad for being a racist. But that wasn't his main point, because Conrad is long dead. His main point was that since the text is taught in American high schools, everyone reads it, that becomes their image of Africa. And there is a problem with that, because after you teach it and read it, that's what you think of Africa, that Africans are people who run around silently, uh, who kill each other, eat each other, have no voice of their own, have no culture of their own. And he's, he finds that really uh, something undesirable about representation of Africa. Right. So he's challenging Conrad's own assumptions and his own racism, Conrad's racism, and then what we do with his text, since it's part of the modernist canon. Right. Now, what happens in the field of Conrad studies after that is no one can teach Heart of Darkness without acknowledging that this voice against it has been raised. I mean, that's what I, I keep pointing out to people who do scholarship. When you go out and write something, and challenge something, it becomes part of a public debate. It becomes part of a repertoire of whatever has been said about a certain subject. And any good scholar then will have to take, and take that into account. Your voice will have to be incorporated in their discussion, or the reviewer or someone else would basically say, well, there is another article which argues differently. Why didn't you account for that? Why didn't you read that? Right. So then in the second part of the paragraph, there is further explanation. So even though Achebe, Chino Achebe, had challenged the canonicity of the text, but by centering that debate, that became the biggest debate in Conrad's studies. So unfortunately, however, Achebe's timely intervention has actually enhanced the very canonicity of Heart of Darkness that he had challenged. For the debate after his intervention has mostly been focused on Heart of Darkness itself, right? So when he raises this huge question about Heart of Darkness, then there is a response to it, there is a counter response. So eventually the scholarly production, instead of focusing other novels of Joseph Conrad, gets more and more 
focused on Heart of Darkness itself, and thus makes Heart of Darkness even more canonical than what it was, right? Um, but as is obvious from Conrad's oeuvre, Heart of Darkness is not only major work about the cultures of the colonial periphery, that's not his only major work, uh, and for Conrad to be a thoroughgoing racist, his representation of other cultures of the colonial periphery must also be taken into account. So it's a very simple uh, sentence. I mean, saying, OK, we can't really define him by one work, right? You can't just read one work of an author, especially if you're going to challenge him and assign him uh, the, the, the name or title of a thoroughgoing racist, then you must read his entire oeuvre, right? Whatever he has produced, and then give us a comprehensive account. Uh, you can't say, you know, Conrad of Heart of Darkness is racist, but then at other places he becomes a good person. So the idea is there's a lot published on Conrad. Conrad is one of the hardest author to publish on uh, because there are, you know, most modernists uh, tend to be either Conrad scholars or uh, Joyce scholars or Beckett scholars. So Conrad is one of the three or four novelists in which you have single author scholars, people who have written dissertations on him, people who have written books on him. They, they claim to be Joseph Conrad scholars. So it's out of the, these three major modernist authors, he is one of the hardest to publish about because pretty much all you can come up with has already been published. So that, that's why it's, it's also a challenge you know, to take something like that. So how, how does this introduction create a space? It says, OK, Heart of Darkness has been read to death and written about to death. Well, let's go to his earlier work. Let's go to his three other novels that he wrote about uh, Mal Malaya, right? And those are called his Malay novels, his first novel, uh, Almer's Folly, his second novel, third novel, Victory, and the, the one uh, that's in between, I always forget its title. So that's the story of a clash between the Dutch traders and the Arab traders and the local Muslim and Hindu population, right? So the idea is, can we see the same instances of racism in those three works, which are about a topic which is the most controversial now, but which the Orientalists used always to deride that was Islam, uh, wherever it existed. And if we cannot find that in Conrad, maybe he's slightly redeemable. You know, maybe uh, there was, you know, a certain way he wanted to write Heart of Darkness. Of course, that argument has all also been made. Edward Said eloquently writes about that. But now look at this introduction and tell me, um, if you are the reviewer, does it tell you what, where the debate is, what has happened because, because of the debate, and where you are hoping to take it? If you were the reviewer, would you get a sense of that? Obviously, there is nothing such as that you know, mankind has been divided into men and women for a long time. So what I'm trying to convey is that it's a one paragraph introduction to, let's say, a 6,000 word essay. And you have to make sure that everything counts. So you're jumping right into the major debate of a, an author. You are in two sentences. You are accounting for what that debate is. And then in the last paragraph, you are taking your reader to your possible thesis. Right? And so try pra practice that. It's always easier to write more. It's harder to write less and condense it. You know? okay. This is not going to happen in your first draft. This is going to happen when you revise it towards the end. No? First draft, write as freely as possible. OK, so next comes the thesis. Who would like to read it? This essay aims to complicate H.B.'s indictment of Conrad and Abai symptomatically by focusing on Conrad's two Muslim characters, Babadashi and Abdullah, from his Mali novels. Reading Conrad's Heart of Darkness in comparison with his earlier works will be helpful in refuting or at least complicating the charge of racism against Conrad. 
It's not necessary to read Conrad in such an extremely banalistic way. Maybe a wider approach to his works would help in retrieving a Conrad uh, more nuanced and ambivalent than the absolute terms in which the HB describes him. This comparative approach takes the discussion beyond the limited scope of heart of darkness and builds on the pro Conrad argument offered by scholars such as Hunt Hawkins, whose response to HB could be made more persuasive by taking into account Conrad's malefiction. Good. Okay. So. Right there is uh, uh, your thesis, what you're planning to do, and in which vein of scholarship would you like to go? Uh, uh, the reason I'm, I you chose this is because it gives me everything to display. You know, like, uh, there is a novel that you're writing about. There is a debate where you are entering the conversation. The debate is about Conrad's racism. And then there are three novels, and you pick up two characters who are your Abdullah is the Arab trader in those three novels, and Babalachi is the local uh, prime minister of the local Raja, right? And uh, and you you go and see how these characters are represented, and then you are suggesting now I am taking Hunt to task, right? Right here, and he was my teacher. So in uh, post I mean, in American graduate studies, you train your graduate students to finally, eventually dismantle your own work, right? So that's the purpose of graduate studies. So Hunt uh, had written a wonderful article published in PMLA in 1982, but Hunt was just a textual scholar. So there is back and forth with him, uh, with Achebe himself. So finally, Achebe writes him a brief letter and where he finally says, no, look, look at this sentence in the text about Africans. You know, you can't tell me Conrad is not a racist. So Hunt had shared those documents with me because I was writing for his class. So I asked him, you know, do you have any background material? So he gave me his entire correspondence with Chinua Achebe. Uh, but of course, I am in the process of this arg argument, basically dismantle Hunt's argument and, and supplant it with my own. But I don't have to be mean about it, right? He's my teacher. He's a great scholar. So that what, instead of saying that Hunt Hawkins was wrong, uh, my argument is that his work could be made more persuasive if we add this to his argument. So that's another way of, uh, especially when you're entering in debate where probably huge giants of your field are fighting each other. Uh, it's good to, you know, fight them, but fight them on your own terms by, by giving them the due respect, respect that they deserve, but then moving on from there. So keep that in mind, too. Sometimes when your articles are being reviewed and you're challenging the assumptions of someone big in the field, the reviewers are even more skeptical because, you know, they're like, who are you to challenge Edward Said, right? Or, or people like that. So you have to be very gentle in your challenging of that. Uh, so. Any questions about about this? So. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, categorically told not to use such words. Huh, yes. Is it the same thing over there? Or? No, it depends on which journal are you publishing with. Now, in everyday speech, uh, I don't use high vocabulary. I don't use even most major theoretical terms. But when you are publishing in your field, uh, you have to, one part of being a scholar is to know the vocabulary of your field. I think that's a disservice to you, yeah. Because uh, as a scholar, you are developing a voice. That voice isn't meant to convince your supervisor that he or she can understand you. That voice is for your field. And uh, it's just like, let me give you a crude example. Uh, when we are amongst children, we emulate them. We, we speak in their voice, right? We have fun with them. Well, what if you started doing that in your classroom? The context matters, right? The suddenly people will say, hey, teacher, to pagal ho 
right? But within the context, it makes perfect sense. So when you are uh, having a conversation with scholars, you cannot use the language of a child. You have to use the language of your field. Uh, and and uh, of course, sometimes people tell you you use a lot of jargon and you use a lot of theory. It happens in America too. Most of the times that comes from people who are anti-theory. Uh, because they themselves don't do it, so they, um, so you have to make a distinction. If it's a scholarly writing, you you don't need to use words that don't belong there. It should come naturally. But if it's a scholarly article, then the the level of discourse and language has to be at the level of the field. If it's a popular article for a newspaper, for a blog, then of course your audience is different, and and the main purpose is for them to be accessible. Uh, but, I mean, there can be extreme forms, too. I mean, I remember uh, famously when Homi Baba's book, The Location of Culture, came out, MLA did a special panel on it, and they, they had to put it in two rooms because it was like standing room only. And after Baba gave his presentation, you know, a, a senior Americanist stood up and said, I have no clue what you've just talked about. I didn't understand a single word. And Baba looked at him and said, you know, that's not my problem. You know. Because, I mean, when you are like Spivak or Baba or Derrida, uh, you are you're thinking at the edge of thought. You know, you, you can't be concerned about whether people would understand you or not, because philosophy is done, you know, on the edge. Uh, but people, mortals like you and me, sometimes should come down and say, OK, uh, I, I will play it differently. But so for us in population of the difficult words that are concerned, I think that's related to the topic of the debate in which we are writing. As uh, in the post-colonial studies, uh, uh, it is necessary to be voiced. If you want to be voiced, you need to use those words in order to write back to them. I think in that case, it is also necessary when you are replying or you are writing back. So in the master's book, you have to reply or you have to write. That's a very good point. I mean, I don't believe in the master's language anymore because it's, I mean, English is as much as our language as it's the language of the Brit. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if when you think of uh, proving to, uh, let's say, scholars in UK or Americans or even common pers people over there, the burden is still on us, right? We, they can very conveniently come in here and not know a single lick of Urdu and be fine with it. But for us to claim um, a certain kind of equal humanity, uh, that's done in the linguistic register, right? And so we claim to say here, you know, we have learned your language, we have mastered it to a point that sometime when we speak to you, you have no clue what we are talking about. There is some really excitement and fun in that. Not that you would do it for that reason, but that is a counter discourse. One is to a, a complete elision of a foreign language and say, you know, I'll only speak to you in Arabic or Urdu. That's another strategy and it has its own merits. But the other is to enter the discourse and say, I, I will master your texts as good or as well as you can, and then see where I go with it. So there is some uh, excitement and some use of that, because then you don't have to apologize for your language. You know, if you have mastered the language and can produce works at the same level as your counterparts in UK, England, Australia, Canada, then what else is there to talk about? You know, you are equal, and in certain ways you're better because you can do things that they cannot do because you can cite this and then you can come back and read a wonderful rabai of Hafiz and say, come on, man to shadam tu man shudi, huh? So, so, I mean, I tell my students sometimes that, you know, that the, the, their great misfortune is that they will never be able to read Fazem at Faz and understand it. And what a waste of life is that, right? But I, I, I get the point. That's okay, so another thing uh, that I would so yeah, don't use big words simply because you're trying to impress someone. They have to be part 
part of a certain discourse in your field, but if it's, a, if it's something that we people use always in your field of study, then it's a normal word to you, you know, and uh, use it freely as it fits the context of your discussion. Anything else? All right, uh, I think I, I don't have any more. So can we go back? Okay, so uh, while you write your thesis statements on your pages, we will try to bring up uh, my website and see if we can download an article and just run through it so that you can see how does the argument develop further. I I'm going to download another one and give you another example which incorporates theory immediately, right? So who can help me with, with that? Uh, can you get to the internet from here? Okay. So meanwhile, we, we can you have can an informal. Just write your yeah. thesis sentence or two sentences, and then we we'll get volunteers. One of you can look that piece of it. Just write uh, one or two thesis statements, anything that comes to your mind. And uh, then I'll ask for volunteers to come over there and put one piece of over there. And then we will go over that pieces. I know it takes a, a bit of courage to come up here, but you're all teachers, you know. We do that to your students, so uh, let's make you suffer through the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just come up with a thesis, and then we'll we'll take a look at it. Okay. So that's my teaching website, postcolonial.net. Uh, pretty much a, there are a lot of resources over here. If you just go there, you'll see there's even a glossary of theory and a lot of resources on postcolonialism. Now this is much better than the main campus. Yadanazi, we could not do this ever over there. I spoke too fast, but it is downloading. So. so if you're ready, who is ready with a thesis statement? Could you? Would that fit on that little board over there? Careful. It's exciting, isn't it? when you become students. we will get to. Uh, I'll go, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using my own articles, not because I'm filled with my own importance, but it's easier for me to work with them because I can imagine how I came up with the idea and everything. So if you think it's slightly pompous of me, please do forgive me. Uh, 
Okay, so this is an article that was published in uh, Journal of African Studies uh, two, three years ago, and it's about a, a novel by Osman Senbi, uh, and uh, he is, uh, where is he from? Okay, we'll figure it out. In, yeah, but the novel was originally published in French and then translated in English. Okay, and it's called God's Bits of Wood. The novel and God's Bits of Wood is a proverb which you know, uh, in Ibu language people use uh, to declare that what are we humans? You know, we are just bits of wood for God, right? So yeah, like we say, So it's the same kind of thing. And the back, it's a realistic novel, so basically. Uh, you know the definition of a realistic novel is that it deals with real life issues and it has characters that are believable and that could be real life character. But it's the, a story of the 1946 strike in Senegal. Okay. And that was the railway strike by railway workers. And what the novel does is it tells you the story of a community that lives together of workers, of peasants, and when the strike happens, how does the community come together? The basic idea is that a strike will not be successful unless a whole community at all levels gets involved with that. And you know it, uh, I don't know, there aren't much labor politics left in Pakistan, but wherever labor uh, is political and have unions, you always know that when a union goes on strike, uh, the factory owners bring in workers to relieve them, uh, those are the workers who in American parlance are called scabs because they scab the work of union workers. But always to break a strike, uh, you either have to forcefully make the workers work or bring in the strike breakers. You bring in labor that is non-unionized and put them on the job. Because the whole idea is, I mean, there are two classes, there are the capitalists and those who must sell their labor and those who must sell their labor are always on a weak footing because they can probably sustain themselves for two weeks or three weeks, whereas the capitalist has enough capital to not even open the factory and still sustain life. So that's the inequality that Adam Smith talks about as well as Marx. So that's the backdrop of it. The reason I'm using this is because it immediately starts with a theoretical concept. And the concept is ideology theorized by uh, um, and, uh, Frederick Jameson, who is the leading Marxist philosopher in America, right? So this is a different kind of paper because it immediately is announcing that I am going to use this concept to read this novel, right? And so that's why it's in the title, The Anatomy of a Strike and the Ideology of Solidarity. Okay. <coughs> So I'm just going to read the first paragraph. Uh, uh, published in French in 1960, Osman Sembin's uh, God's Bits of Wood serves a two-pronged purpose of representing a narrativized, particularistic account of a strike while also offering certain universal aspects of class struggle. So that's the introductory paragraph. Possibly a thesis, but still an introductory paragraph. This dual focus on the local and the global makes the novel a perfect didactic instrument for teaching resistance in the current state of neoliberal capital. Okay. So another slight enhancement of the earlier statement. Then, using Frederick Jameson's concept of the ideology, this essay discusses the novel's attempt to represent the 1948 Dakar strike as a clue to learning the absolute necessary preconditions for successful resistance in the neoliberal regime of high capital. So that's the thesis. Okay. Now the difference between the earlier thesis that I talked about and this is that this essay is already announcing itself to be highly theoretical. It's saying I am going to use a very complex concept called the ideology. I'm going to hope that you know what neoliberal capital means. 
and then I am going to show you within the next 20 or 25 pages how this particular novel can be used in a classroom to teach our students what possibilities of resistance exist for people against the power of global capital and, and what would need to be done. But I will do that not by just close reading the text, but by applying theory to it. Right? Uh, so you can see at the top already there is a, uh, I've already quoted um, Frederick Jameson's uh, definition of the ideology in itself, and he says, the ideology is an amphibious formation whose structural characteristics may be described as its possibility to manifest either as a pseudo-idea, a conceptual or belief system, and an abstract value, an opinion, or, pro or prejudice, or as a proto-narrative, a kind of ultimate class fantasy about the collective characters which are the classes in opposition. Even the definition is kind of hard to figure out, right? So, so the idea is that if you look at a living culture or a specific cultural location, and this comes from Jameson's book called The Political Unconscious. So of course, the political unconscious itself is a retake on uh, Carl Jung's concept of collective unconscious, right? So Jung's idea was when he studies and he breaks away from Freud, his idea was that there is something in this world that somehow gives us a collective unconsciousness because there are certain things we humans universally experience the same way. We are all afraid of dark, right? Uh, we all uh, uh, think differently about, you know, the concept of God. We all want to love or be loved. So his idea was that there is some sort of a collective unconscious that we all humans share. So of course, Jameson is picking that concept up and calling it the political unconscious. So his, in this book, he basically reads quite a few novels, and his idea is the best way. And the book is very uh, crucial to Marx, Marxism in uh, in America because his first paragraph is basically he declares that the purpose of this book is to prove to you that Marxism is the absolute horizon of literary criticism. Basically, Jameson is saying you cannot do literary criticism without Marxism. Now, it's, it's a very ambitious book. And so the, uh, the concept of the ideology for him is that if you look at, if you read a novel, or a set of novels from a certain time period, it's easier to interpret them if you can figure out what was the dominant ideology at that time. Right? How was gender defined? Let's say if you could concretize it in one or two concepts. And then if you know what was the reigning ideology, then you can run it through the text. Because in Marxist tradition, of course, the text are not detached from the world. You know, the writers are in the world. They live in the world. They have a certain politics. They have a certain political location. So even when they are trying to be neutral, no one is really neutral because we are determined by our own prejudices, our own class affiliations. So his idea is if we decipher that, what is the ideology of a certain epoch, then we can read those novels with that idea and open them up. So, Using that concept, my idea was that the ideology for this particular novel is solidarity, okay? That for the workers' strike to succeed, the community must, so there, there cannot be like one central leader, because that's, that would be kind of fascist thinking, right? Uh, but the community from different locations must come together in solidarity, right? And the best thing about solidarity is that it doesn't presuppose a hierarchy. A solid, solidarity is a group of equals. So then after that, there's a certain problem. You know, uh, we need more theory to, to further develop this discussion. And so we need to know, you know, how do we tell stories? 
in that body of this essay, and that's where then I go to. Uh,